Thanks very much. A couple of sentiments I'll open with before I get into the body of the presentation, if I may. The first one is that uh, our view is that data viewed in isolation without the appropriate context wrapped around it can be misleading. And you'll see a few slides we're going to get further into the body of the presentation where viewed in isolation, they'd make a very nasty headline, but when you wrap some context around what that data is telling us and you've got the whole story, it's actually a success story. Uh, the second sentiment that I'll ask you to, uh, to hold dear is that our experience has been that data doesn't replace uh, wisdom or experience or the, uh, uh, the crusty old uh, uh, property manager driving around his land cruiser it me merely augments that, uh, that expertise and experience. That's also been uh, something that we've seen when we've laid very technical analysis over what's tradi traditionally been done. Sometimes the results are remarkably similar. So who we are and what we are. Uh, we're Western Lands leaseholders in the Western Division of New South Wales. We've got two sites, one near Menindee uh, and another site over near Cobar. Uh, we're semi-arid. Uh, we've got a fragile environment, so we've got an inherent responsibility to look after the, the natural resources as well as trying to eke a profit out of our enterprise. About 18 months ago, we embarked on a very aggressive CapEx plan, and part of that CapEx plan involved significant investment in infrastructure. Uh, we committed to trying to gather as much data and as much technology as we could to make sure that our CapEx plan was responsible. We were spending our dollars in the best possible way. We were going to drive the best uh, uh, productivity returns. We were going to be able to protect the environment that we occupy. And the fourth one, which doesn't get mentioned so much, is that would our CapEx plan, would the way that we're occupying this landscape allow us to rehabilitate landscapes that have been degraded by previous land managers. And we'll see a few examples of where we're trying to use technology to patch up some damage that uh, well intended, perhaps, uh, perhaps clumsy people uh, caused before us. So our search for better digital tools. 18 months ago we started down this path and we found ourselves looking at a range of different digital tools. So a lot of what, or pretty much what, everything that we needed was freely available in the public domain, but we didn't find a way that we could successfully layer all those digital uh, resources on top of each other and form a comprehensive plan, uh, other than to have six screens available and be jumping from one screen to the other and trying to do a visual representation of, of how the data overlaid. Uh, and then we came across, uh, via our local land service extension officer, we came across a product that we are confident, or we were confident at the time, and it's proved to be successful, was going to be able to give us all of the data that we were accessing from those various sources and put it into one place in a, in a layered structure so that we could turn it on and turn it off and we can look through various layers to see what we were achieving. To change anything, uh, of course, there's going to be challenges, and uh, we had a, a quote about change just a moment ago from Darwin, and my favourite quote about change, I think, is attributed to um, Mahatma Gandhi about, if you cannot change, you cannot change anything. Uh, we went on a program of trying to rewater, refence, reorganise extensive rangelands in western New South Wales. We didn't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but we didn't want to be tied to convention. Maybe a fence line was aligned because 50 years ago they didn't have the heavy equipment uh, to move uh, the, the vegetation they needed to move to, to put a fence where it logically should have gone. So we might have found the water sources were somewhere that it was convenient to put water, and maybe when they were pushing water through one inch poly with an old windmill, that's as far as they could push it, so that's where they put the tank in the trough. Now that we're running two inch PVC and variable rate pumps and, uh, and we've got uh, uh, mains power on our property, we could do different things with water. So we didn't want to be tied to the, to the legacy condition. So in our strategic decision making, we were prepared to challenge those conventions. We also wanted to be able to use the spatial data for our tactical decision making, uh, so that how we went about running the property once we'd set up all of our infrastructure, uh, things like how we'd spell the country. Uh, the fourth point down is one of my personal favourites, is how we're going to monitor the effect of our presence on the landscape and have a look how long have we been here and what effect have we had and then project that what effect are we likely to have on this fragile landscape if we keep doing what we're doing. And spatial data is you know, a key tool to be able to do that for us. The NRM Spatial Hub, it got mentioned yesterday, a couple of times in fact at presentations that I listened into. The NRM Spatial Hub is the tool that we came across that enabled us to do all of this. The NRM Spatial Hub, you could read for yourself, is a collaboration of all the states and territories, uh, and I'm led to believe there's 700 existing users, of which uh, we're the most prominent and the most famous. Really. 
the anaerobic spatial hub, what it does for us. We don't use all aspects of it. There's uh, grazers in the far north of Queensland that will use aspects of the anaerobic spatial hub uh, to do things that we simply don't need to do, and I'm sure that we're doing things uh, that uh, dairy producers in Gippsland wouldn't be interested in. But the things that we use the anaerobic spatial hub for uh, are on the list there, and I'll go through and give you some practical examples about how they look uh, out in the paddock. The mapping infrastructure, this one's a bit of a no-brainer. There's multiple platforms available that you can create a farm map with, uh, so there's no secret on what farm mapping looks like using digital tools. Uh, and, oops, sorry. And this is just an aerial shot of the big Ampy Homestead complex, the airstrip. We were able to, like, to use the mapping tools and to build up a series of layers. The things that we like about the mapping features of the NRM Spatial Hub is the exports that we can take. We can take GPS exports to, for field use. Uh, we can run a series of what-if scenarios. Uh, we can uh, do cost analysis of assets, uh, a range of things that the other commercially available mapping platforms didn't allow us to do. But let's get to the, some of the environmental things that we can do with this mapping platform. That's what it looks like after we've populated uh, the various layers with all of the, the infrastructure around that homestead complex. Here's an example of using that mapping application to try to recover some previously degraded land. Uh, we recently picked up uh, a block next door. Uh, that block next door had some significant scalded areas around that, which is an old decrepit set of sheep yards with a crutching shed, which used to be the shearing shed. And over the last 100 years, there's probably been millions of sheep stand around that facility uh, and their hooves have trampled the vegetation out of it and compacted the soil and left the landscape with those ugly scars. We can see that with the high resolution digital imagery. We can plot those scars as a polygon. We get a perimeter, an area, and we get GPX coordinates for all of those places. And we can also put a profile tool over it and see what the gradient is of that scar. Uh, we've got our own dozer and grader. We can go out there with, a, with, uh, with our own equipment and do some remedial land works and see if we, we haven't done it yet, we'll see if we can recover these scolds. So that's a work in progress. That's an example of using this sort of spatial data to, to maybe fix up the yields of the past. Profiling water lines. I spoke about using that profile tool just a moment ago. Another thing that we use the NRM Spatial Hub for is to profile water lines and then we can take some of this data out into the field. We don't need to engage a surveyor to tell us uh, how our water lines are going to lay, what the elevations are going to be, uh, what head pressure we need to push over a hill, for example. But there's also an environmental aspect of being able to build a three-dimensional map of a water line, and that is drains and erosion. You notice how I'm going from a commercial side, and then I go to the environmental side, and we're using these digital tools hand in hand. We form the view that commercial enterprise and environmental concerns need to cohabitate, and if, if they get out of balance and we focus just on commercial or we focus just on environmental concerns, well, it's probably to the detriment of the other, the other factor. There's a Commonwealth stock route that, oops, I keep pushing that, I'm sorry. There's a Commonwealth stock route that goes through our property, Big Ampy, uh, and those dams would have been built by the architects of the CSR, uh, and the architects of the CSR built drains along this uh, embankment to fill this water supply for the drovers as I'd go through, pre-trucks and trains. We see a lot of erosion along that bank line. Using the NRM tool, I was able to zoom into high resolution and actually map individual drains. And that red line is a particular drain. And then I can calculate what the gradient is of that drain. And not surprising what's causing the erosion, that the drains are five times steeper than we would put a drain in. We've got a gradient that we would carve to. And these drains are simply aligned incorrectly. But they were put that way probably in 1910, 1920 by folks who didn't know any better. We've got an opportunity now to recover that. And we're adamant that we will be able to realign these drains and over time recover that badly eroded hillside. Mapping land types. Uh, as part of our total grazing management plan, we need to understand what the underlying soil is, what the underlying land type is. Once we've done that, we can identify our key perennial species. Uh, we've done feed surveys at different growth cycles of those key species, so we know what we're producing as far as energy and protein. And then, when we, because the mapping tool allows us to measure 
areas of land type by paddock or by polygon or by area that we define, we can come up with some very accurate feed budgets and if uh, the, uh, the nannies are lactating, we know that their protein demand is going to go up and we, then we know we can move them onto some different country that has a, a, a you know, a chanopod species that has more protein in it. We know all that because we understand our underlying land, land type. Uh, it might sound pretty obvious, but across 300,000 acres, there's a big range of, uh, of land forms and land types. So uh, uh, it becomes an important part of our management tool about where we move things and how we uh, arrange our, our livestock. Another thing that we do with this land type mapping is identify areas that we can responsibly crop. Now this isn't over near Menindi before anybody has a heart attack and thinks that we're cultivating in 260 mils of rain country. This is on another block that we've got near Cobar. Uh, and we can see that there is a strip of cropping within our boundary down there. And that's that colour. It correlates to the Australian Land and Soil Capability Class 3, uh, which has got minimal restrictions. So it's, the land is, or well, the land form is suitable for cultivation. We wanted to see on this 64,000 acre block where there was some more of that country that was logistically going to lend itself to cropping. There's a road that goes down through there and there's another stripe through there, which is the same land type. So we can submit an application for a cultivation consent based on some science and some logic and we say we can get access to it, we can measure the gradient, we know what the land type is, we can look through the layer and see that we don't have Mallee underneath it. Uh, so that's another example of using these sorts of digital tools to make strategic decisions. Plotting distance from water, uh, hopefully most people in the room are familiar with this technology where you put range rings depending on the class of stock, uh, depending on how much moisture is on the ground and moisture in the forage, uh, you, you can put range rings around it to determine the carrying capacity. We've taken this one step further, so this technology isn't particularly new, but what we were keen to be able to do with it was experiment with moving waters away from fence lines and away from corners and also establishing new waters. The block that we've got, because it was watered before mains power was there, most of the water points are, are in the corners of paddocks and you can imagine what the traffic load is like and what the, what the, uh, the biomass looks like within a kilometre of the trough. So we were keen to, now that we've got the capability of pushing water further and more efficiently, we wanted to push the water out of the paddocks and we can put a dollar value to that using this tool. So here's an example of this paddock that we've just fenced in, uh, we wanted to assess if we put water there, which is about two kilometres into that paddock, it would recover this area as a grazing opportunity. Uh, we can translate that into a current capacity. Now we know that a trough on the fence and a tank on the fence will cost us almost the same as a tank or a trough out there. Two kilometres of poly, and on, in our scale that's, that's next to nothing. We can run two kilometres of poly out there and open up a whole bunch of country and pick up X amount of, of dry sheep equivalent per annum. So we can translate that easily to a cost and figure out that's the way that we're going to do it. Ground cover. I mentioned earlier about looking at the impact that we have on the landscape and, and having a look at whether we're behaving responsibly. When we look at land cover, we look at an absolute value of land cover, uh, ground cover I should say, uh, which is the bottom gra uh, graph, and the top graph is relative to an area that you define. And in this case, We've got a, the perimeter of Big Ampy, which is the shaded area, and then we've got a 20 kilometre boundary around Big Ampy that we're comparing ourselves to, and that it, there is where we bought Big Ampy, in, uh, that where the red dot is, so that we can see that since we purchased Big Ampy, we haven't driven the country backwards relative to the neighbours. Now, you, it's important that you can define what you're comparing yourself to. You can compare yourself to everything, or you could just pick uh, a high performing neighbour or you can pick a paddock or you can pick a land type to form a comparison and say how, how are our activities affecting the landscape compared to X, Y or Z. So what we can see here is that since we've been the custodians of Big, Big Ampy, the relative to 20 kilometres radius all around us, that we've got more relative ground cover than, than everybody else and absolutely uh, you know, we haven't heard anything as well. I'll go on, on to some pest management initiatives. I'll skip through that one. Pest control fencing. We suffer from kangaroos and feral goats. We like goats as long as they're behind fence and we're controlling their, their husbandry, but the feral goats, we don't like. We chop their heads off. So we've put uh, pest-proof fences around this paddock and we can see that well, we put that in in August last year, March last year. 
and you have a look at the, the absolute ground cover and then the relative ground cover, that dot is when the fence was completed. When we put the fence in, we put a new water in, we introduced 500 nannies that weren't there before, but they were managed nannies with approved genetic su uh, supply, and we've now got more ground cover, absolute and relative, with more livestock in the paddock because we've excluded the pests. So people talking about exclusionary fencing could be using this tool to prove their case. Last one that I want to run through, and I said in my opening comments about uh, single source data could be misleading if you don't have the backstory. We suffer from invasive native scrub, so uh, undesirable woody weeds uh, in fairly large areas. This polygon is 2,500 acres of invasive native scrub, predominantly turpentine and narrowleaf hop bush that we pulled, a couple of dozers and a 700 foot chain, under a property vegetation plan. We pulled that country in September 2015, and you can imagine the, the mess that you make when you pull country to destroy an invasive woody weed. Uh, that's, uh, that's unavoidable, unfortunately, but the solution is the, if you leave the invasive woody weed there, it keeps invading, and then all the perennials eventually die out. Now, that line is when we put the dozers through and pulled that country. The green vegetation dropped down to next to zero, not surprisingly. The red is the bare earth, and that spiked up. That stops at September 15, so that was a year after we pulled the country. We can see that the green is starting to recover and the bare earth is starting to go down. Uh, and in, 20, oh, sorry, in September 17, another year later, hopefully we'll see a crossover and ultimately, we were in, probably in two years' time, I'd, be able, I'd like to be able to prove that as far as green vegetation and bare earth, where the green is sitting up here, higher than it ever was before we treated the invasive native scrub. So that's an example of data in isolation doesn't tell the whole story. If you just had a look at that, you'd think we're environmental vandals, but in actual fact, we're trying to recover a landscape and restore the perennials that naturally occur in that environment. So the NRM Spatial Hub, uh, it's moving forward, it's iterative, it continues to develop. Uh, we continue to give feedback to the, the guys and girls behind it, and they'll, uh, they'll take on board the comments from producers. And for more information on the NRM Spatial Hub, Michael Digby, who's sitting front and centre in the front row, uh, will be able to uh, answer any more technical questions, uh, and I can speak to how we use it practically for economic reasons, capex reasons and environmental reasons, what it looks like out in the paddock when we're driving our Land Cruiser. Thank you.